Well, good morning, and it's so nice to talk to you in person and not via Zoom, <laughs> which really became quite tedious uh, towards the end of that period. And thank you, Brian and Anna, for allowing us all to meet again in person and exchange ideas and knowledge. So, I'm going to talk about how the emperors of China used ceramics in their execution of power and prestige. And I'm going to talk about three different topics. One is how ceramic vessels, in particular porcelain vessels, were used um, as it, sacrificial vessels in the state religion carried out by the emperor as part of his duties. The second is how ceramics were used as accoutrements in the giving of banquets and other power events, so imperial crockery, if you like. And the third way is as a material demonstration of China's superior technology, about which the empire was very proud. So let's start with this manifestation as sacrificial porcelain. Now, the emperor of China is known as the son of heaven. And that is not an honorific title. That is what emperors themselves believed, and so did their subjects. The, as Ava has just told us, the emperor ruled over the dominion of earth and also harmonized with the power of heaven. The mandate to rule was bestowed by heaven. So the emperor himself was a direct intermediary between the world below and the imperial celestial world, the world of the heavens. And in order to carry out that mandate, in order to legitimize his rule, the emperor not only had to rule as a virtuous terrestrial ruler over his empire and his dominions, but he also had to carry out a series of ceremonies to propitiate and to service the celestial powers. And this has been a feature of Chinese dynastic rule from very, very early times. So these state sacrificial ceremonies, they played an important role as early as the Zhou dynasty, the 10th century BC, when there are records of exhaustive regulations being formulated and set down for the performance of these ceremonies by the emperor in his role as the son of heaven. And he was the only legitimate person with this mandate from heaven. And if he lost that mandate, then he failed. He, he was deposed or he died. Now, different, the, the state ceremonies evolved, obviously, over the, the huge course of Chinese history. And I'm going to be talking primarily about those two later periods that Ava's just talked to us about, the Ming Dynasty and the Qing Dynasty. That's to say the period from 1368 down to the early 20th century. So that's mainly what I'm talking about. But we have to remember that there's a great weight of Chinese history before this, and in particular in these state rituals. So in China, there were various forms of religion um, at different periods. There was Buddhism, of course, there was Taoism, um, Confucianism, which was more a philosophy than a religion, really. But the state religion practiced by the emperor was a distinct and separate form. And he carried out his pursuit of, those, of, of that mandate every year by conducting a sacrifice at various temples in and around his capital. So by the period that I'm talking about, the emperor in person uh, conducted a major sacrifice to heaven, the earth, 
the sun, the moon, the temple of imperial ancestors, the patron deity of agriculture, and the guardian spirits of the state and harvests. And what's on the screen now are some of those um, temples and ruined sites of those temples in and around the city of Beijing. Um, these are very late manifestations of, of those temples. Now, how does that have a connection with porcelain? Because early on, the ritual implements and vessels used in those ceremonies were made of precious metals. They were made of gold, of silver, and of bronze. And Chinese bronzes had um, great um, power, and you probably are all aware of the great facility of the Chinese in casting bronze vessels of in incredible complexity from early times. However, all that changed at the beginning of the Ming Dynasty, when this man um, came to power, the Emperor uh, Hu. Now, the Ming Dynasty came to power by throwing out the dreaded Mongols. The previous dynasty, as Ava has already mentioned, was the Yuan Dynasty, and that was the dynasty governed by the invading Mongols who had caused devastation across East Asia, Central Asia, um, and even points further west. And the Chinese absolutely hated being ruled by this foreign power. So in 1279, Kublai Khan, who was the grandson of, of Genghis Khan, invaded China and founded his own Mongol dynasty in China. But by the early 14th century, the power of the Mongols in China was declining. And by the mid-14th century, there were disparate bands of rebels who finally combined together to form a military force that actually defeated the Mongols and drove them out of China. And the man who headed up those uh, regiments was the man who became the Emperor Hung. Now, he was a man of simple tastes. I mean, he came from a humble background, and he was very keen on people not being too extravagant. The early uh, Ming Dynasty was a, a time of, of poverty, really. I mean, the, 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 the incoming dynasty didn't have great inherited wealth um, and material goods, and so Hung Wu really emphasized how people should prioritize simplicity and frugality. And that included himself and the imperial family and his pursuit of this mantle of state religion which he took on to legitimize his rule. So he became the son of heaven and he started conducting these um, rituals at the imperial temples which were hastily rebuilt. And in the second year of his reign, that is 1369, an imperial order went out ordering that all ceremonial vessels used in state sacrifices should henceforward be made of porcelain. Now, in this case, it means that porcelain is the cheap alternative to bronze or gold or silver or more exotic things. And we can see perhaps um, the kind of thing that was um, meant by this. This is a, a page from one of the Ming statute books, and this is um, showing the layout of vessels at the Temple of the Imperial Ancestors. And in the front, you can see two candlesticks and an incense burner, then the ancestral tablets behind that, and then rows of these vessels which contained um, a wide variety of meat and vegetable dishes which were used in the uh, sacrificial offering banquets. And I have to say, the, the ceremonies varied from temple to temple, but very often live animals were slaughtered in order to you know, provide fresh um, sacrifice to offer to whichever deity was being worshipped. And at the back of this rather sketchy picture, can you see these strange little three-legged vessels. The, the vessels in front, these dishes, could really be made of almost anything, but those strange little three-legged things in the back are 
what are called jue. Now, this is an ancient Chinese bronze form. They were originally made uh, during China's Bronze Age, maybe um, 1500 BC, so, you know, a long time before this time. And the use of the jue, you have to imagine this being cast in bronze, it was to heat wine, and you could actually light a little fire under its legs, and then when the sacrificial wine or alcohol was heated up, you could lift it away from the heat using these two little posts on top. So it kind of made sense as a bronze vessel, you could cast it in a mould, but you just imagine making that in porcelain. I mean, very, very finickety, and not at all a kind of natural porcelain shape. And the one on the left, as you can see, is um, a white porcelain piece. Um, and we know that the, in the Ming and Qing, there were specific regulations for colour for these, alt for these uh, temples. So blue was for the altar of heaven, yellow in the altar of the earth, red in the altar of the sun, pale blue in the altar of the moon, and white in the temple of imperial ancestors. And I was very thrilled. This piece you can see on the left was in the v &A, and nobody really kind of knew what it was or how it dated. Nobody quite believed it. And in the 1980s, um, one of China's great porcelain experts from the, uh, the Palace Museum, the Imperial Collection, came to the v &A, a man called Gung Bao Chang, who was, oh, really the guru of porcelain. And he looked at this piece and he said, you know that dates to the Yongle period. You know it's an imperial um, altar vessel. And so I was really, you know, this was a great discovery. It's a very rare and wonderful piece. And you can see on the right here another jue um, that's in the British Museum, and that dates to the 16th century. So this manner of using uh, vessels made of porcelain for the altars continued from the Ming Dynasty into the Qing Dynasty. And here is a set of um, sacrificial vessels, all of them now in the v &A. There are many of these around the world. And these date to the 18th century. Most were made in the reign of the great Emperor Qianlong, who I shall talk about some more. And again, these are different colours for the different temples, as I mentioned to you. And they're all in the shape of bronzes. Now, if you look at the jars, those are relatively straightforward to make in ceramic. But the thing at the back, the yellow thing, is a, a sort of cup on a stem with a lid. And that's a bronze shape called dou. And then this incredible piece in the foreground that's blue. Again, imagine how difficult these were to make in porcelain in multiple sets for the temples. And indeed, there were many pieces made. Um, there are many records. Uh, for example, in um, 1538, the imperial kilns at Jingdezhen dispatched 1,510 completed pieces of white porcelain, in, and they included uh, bowls, dishes, and those vessels called jue. And in 1558, an official from the court was sent to supervise the making of 30,000 porcelain vessels for religious temples um, in the capital. So this was really, these were big orders. And it's said that in the 18th century, there's recently been some work done in Hong Kong at the Chinese University Museum, that these 18th century vessels were actually personally designed by the Emperor Qianlong himself. He had a say in their design and their, their production. I'm going to be talking about Jingdezhen a bit, so you just have to keep in your mind that in the period that I'm talking about, the imperial capital was in Beijing in the north, and Jingdezhen is in the central south, about 200 kilometers further south. And in order to make these huge orders of whatever porcelain, they had to be packed up, put into flat bottom boats, poled up rivers, it wasn't road transport, it was waterborne, across, across the great Boyang Lake, into the Yangtze River, and then up the Grand Canal to Beijing. So, not only producing these vessels was big and difficult, but actually getting them from the imperial kiln up to the palace was difficult as well. 
So now I'm going to move on to talk about the second category of imperial use of porcelain. And that is um, as an accoutrement for throwing banquets. And I call them power events because other speakers have said this. Actually, the provision of um, food and drink in a grand setting is it in itself an expression of power. You know, you're making a statement. You're not just feeding people. You're, it's actually a ceremony. So we start with this. This is a Ming Dynasty um, picture, one of the uh, illustrations of things that went on in the palace. And this is a, a banquet in the Hall of Supreme Harmony, which is one of the three big halls in the front of the Forbidden City, the palace site. And you can see the... Um, arcade going up to the hall and then I, sorry it's a bit blurred but you can see on one side these are all the dishes of food all the stacked up um, bamboo baskets of food waiting to go into the banquet now can you imagine how cold <laughs> and congealed some of that food might have been once it got to the banqueters and I have to say that the provision of food in the palace was a real problem throughout history. As you know, the Forbidden City is a, a lateral site. You know, it, it covers a very vast area. There are the, the three big ceremonial halls at the front where a lot of official banqueting and other ceremonies took place. And then in the back of the Forbidden City, there's an enormous residential area where the emperor lived, the empress, and then the concubines and the collateral relatives and the huge retinue of servants and um, people who helped make the Forbidden City work. So you had to get food out to all of these people. Now the Imperial Kitchen was actually just outside the east wall of the inner Forbidden City. So all the food was cooked there and then it was ferried in to wherever it was needed. In this case it's a grand banquet but you know sometimes it had to travel quite a distance. And also, if you think about Beijing, Beijing in winter is terribly cold. I mean, it's absolutely freezing. It's so cold that you don't, not only have to wear, you know, coat and hat and gloves, you actually need to wear padded shoes on your feet to stop the cold striking up through the, 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 the soles of your feet. So carrying food from the kitchens, even in padded baskets, and even if you could reheat it perhaps on little burners, was a phenomenal undertaking. And there are many stories um, about different emperors. I'll, I'll just tell you a couple. Um, the famous Qianlong Emperor in the 18th century, he was a very hard-working man, and he really paid attention to all his imperial duties. I mean, emperors of China, if they operated properly, were very, very busy people from morning to night. So he would get up at first light, he would break his fast with a small amount of food, and then he would work his way through the duties, which might be a huge variety of things, meeting foreign envoys, um, receiving lists of, of tribute, um, working on imperial religious ceremonies, throwing banquets. I mean, he had a program that was absolutely set out for him. And if he was on duty in the Forbidden City itself, in the palace, he was often quite mobile. You know, he'd go to appointment one, and then he'd go to appointment two in quite a different part of the palace. And when he decided he wished to eat, he expected the food to be there. So the system was that a, a number of, of um, waiters from the imperial kitchen would hover at a discreet distance, ready to serve food, whenever the emperor should decide that he wanted to eat. And of course, the food would get cold, so then it, there would have to be a series of runners who'd come from the kitchen bearing fresh, hot food. And so that when the emperor decided, you know, my blood sugar has dropped, I need to eat, there would be food uh, ready for him. And the other story is about the empress Zixi. She's the last empress um, formidable woman who ruled in the late 19th century um, and had jurisdiction over a series of rather weak-willed emperors. Anyway, Zixi was a great one for protocol. Um, she really wanted to be treated properly, and so she decreed that she should have a very 
broad range of food at each of her official meals. So there was something set down for what she wanted to eat. But it was known that Susi had particular favourites. There would be this huge spread of food, and she'd really only eat maybe half a dozen of them, which were her favourites. So those dishes were always fresh and newly made, but some of the outlying dishes that she was known not to be quite so fond of would be recycled several times, and they'd turn up. Um, <laughs> yes. And um, I think they were fairly confident that she'd never want to taste those, so they just kept coming back and back. So, as part of this, is this is um, official, this is a banquet, and associated with the banquet were particular kinds of porcelain. Now, in the Ming Dynasty, um, and in the Qing to a certain extent, the household, the imperial household, was run through a series of agencies or departments in the palace. And the service was governed by eunuchs. The Chinese emperors relied on eunuchs because they were seen as in many cultures as being safe to guard the women of the household. And they were very largely relied on. And the eunuchs headed up different directories that did different things in the palace. Well, you can imagine it was sometimes chaotic. There was a lot of internecine arguments about who did what and juggling for position. But the, there was one directorate called the Shangshan Jian, which meant the Directorate for Palace Delicacies. And that was a department in the palace that was responsible for providing special foods from the palace gardens. And they, their livery of porcelain was yellow and green wares with dragon and phoenix designs. So if you saw this, you knew it came from that department. And when they excavated the sites of the imperial kiln in Jingdezhen, sure enough, they found some. An even bigger directorate was called the Guanglu Si, and this was the um, Court for Imperial Entertainments. And this was a very big division, actually, because it was in charge of catering for the imperial household, for court officials, and imperial banquets honouring foreign envoys and other dignitaries. So this was a big, powerful department. And their livery of porcelain was blue and white porcelain with dragon and phoenix decorations on it. And orders from this particular department could be very large. For example, in 1433, an official was sent down from the department in the palace to the imperial kiln to supervise production of 443,500 pieces of blue and white porcelain with dragons and phoenixes on them. So it was big business. And I just want to divert from um, sort of table crockery to something else that went on. This is an enormous porcelain cistern. Um, I took this photograph at the site of the imperial excavations, and you can see the scale from the Chinese tea mug by it. So it's really a big thing. Now, in the imperial city, there was tremendous danger of fire. The, the buildings were wood frame. The buildings are wood frame with infill walls. And apart from the dangers of setting it alight with a, a stove in winter, there were also lightning strikes which could cause huge fires. And there are many records of, of buildings in the Imperial City, in the Forbidden City, burning down. So if you go to the Forbidden City now, in front of the big halls, there are huge uh, gilt bronze tanks um, which were made to to contain water so that the fire brigade in the palace could, you know, if there was a fire, could rush out and use these tanks of water. Well, for some reason that's unclear to me, in 1441, the reigning emperor decided that he didn't want um, bronze tanks. He wanted white porcelain cisterns decorated with blue dragons to act um, as fire cisterns. And to make this kind of piece in 1441 was really beyond the technical competence of the potter. If you look at the size of this, these huge cisterns, you can only, th these are thrown, they're thrown in sections. And you can only throw something that 
you know, the human male arm can reach across to throw. So, you know, it's an enormous thing to make, an enormous physical effort. And I've seen them throwing these big pieces in Jingdezhen today. And what happens is that the thrower, usually a young, strong man, throws the section. And he actually has another man who puts his arm round his waist to support him as he throws. I mean, this is a very, very difficult thing to do with porcelain clay. So making these was an enormous effort. Then you had to fire them, and they needed their individual saggers to put the porcelain in. Um, and it was really a complicated business. So, disaster. It didn't work. The first firing was under the supervision of a eunuch who'd been sent from the palace called Wang Dun. And when the pieces came out of the kiln, they had cracks. Disaster. Wang Dun was severely punished. There are two accounts of what happened to him. One says that he was sent off to the border regions to serve, which was a fate worse than death for a, a cosmopolitan Chinese bureaucrat. But another account says that he was actually put to death because he had super, you know, his, his mission to have these great cisterns made had failed. So they sent another eunuch down from the palace to try a second time. And this eunuch was bribed with lots of silk and official um, gifts. However, that failed as well. And not one of these big blue and white cisterns ever reached the palace. Now, this is recorded in the imperial records, but it was actually confirmed in the 1980s when they were excavating the imperial kiln because they found the remains of 27 of these failed cisterns that had been broken up and buried in a pit under one wall of the kiln. So it was obviously a complete disaster, the whole um, episode. The palace was very demanding. Um, you never knew, or the kilns never knew from year to year, how much would be desired. So the 16th century we have quite good records for, and this is a record of the number of pieces that were ordered from the imperial palace um, through the years of one reign, the Jiajing reign in, in, in the mid-16th century. And this, you have to remember, <clears throat> It means all kinds of pieces, you know, small dinner wares, huge cisterns, sacrificial temple wares, you know, these, this is the whole lot. And you can see how the numbers really vary. I mean, some years, 948 is not much, is it? But down here, 120,000. So the director of the imperial kiln never quite knew what was coming at him. And it was really a... a, a a mixed blessing to own that post. And as the 16th century went on, the Ming Dynasty was declining in power and the orders got more and more extreme and the punishments got harsher. And there was particular trouble with making pieces which uh, were unusual or difficult to make. And these included candlesticks, um, huge, those huge cisterns, chessboards and giant vases. And the kilns often petitioned for the orders to be reduced or stopped. Um, and in 1585, finally, the imperial city sent an official down who had a look at what was going on in the kilns. And he said that all the difficult orders that was in production should be continued. But after that, the orders should be cancelled. And um, these included, this is a, 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 a late 16th century system. By this time, they could make them. This is not a, for the fire. This is probably for growing lotus in or keeping goldfish in. But these were difficult to make. And um, there are lots of apocryphal stories about how difficult these pieces were to make. So let's move on to the Qing dynasty. And here's a family banquet in the... Palace of Heavenly Purity. And this was a, a, a mock-up by curators in the Palace Museum in Beijing of an, a, an event that actually took place. And this was actually a, a banquet um, 
for, given by the Emperor Qianlong to female members of his family. And under a large board, uh, which inscribed his magnificence, a, a table was laid out for the emperor. It's on the throne in the background. And for this banquet, there were 20 hot dishes, 20 cold dishes, four soups, four dishes of pickles, four plates of fresh fruit, 28 plates of melon and preserved fruits, 29 plates of cakes, pastries, buns, and biscuits. Altogether, there were 109 items. Now, the emperor had his own place up on the throne platform. The empress um, herself um, had a table placed to the east of the emperor's platform, but all the other palace ladies who attended these, these, um, this banquet, all the ladies below the empress in rank, were not provided with seats, so they had to stand for their dinner. Um, and where's for the different um, ranks of female guests, were precisely delineated. So if you look at those, all of these belonged to women of different ranks. So for example, the yellow and green, the second from the bottom, that was made for an imperial consort. But the one above, the green with the, the purple dragon on it, that was made for a ninth rank concubine, rather low down the scale. Um, I'm afraid I can't remember what the top and bottom ones are, but depending on your rank in the palace, you had your own crockery, and you were very, um, you guarded that privilege very securely. So, um, who went to this um, banquet? There was, of course, the empress, the imperial consorts, who were the highest rank, the high consorts, one rank down, the consorts, the imperial concubines, and other court ladies and princes. And as I said, all of these poor ladies had to stand around to eat. Um, the empress had a table to herself, but every other table catered for two people. Um, and the emperor was provided with 20 dishes, and every other table had 15 plates of dishes only to share between the two. And the banquet could only begin when the emperor was seated, so he was really keeping his thumb on this event. There were similar banquets given for male members of the imperial family, but I think the women suffered perhaps particularly hard. Now I want to move on to the last category of, of um, imperial power demonstration that I want to talk about, which is this is porcelain as a demonstration of China's superior technology. And I have to say here, this, I'm sorry this is a dreadful picture, but it was a sort of um, awakening picture for me. This was in 1996. I went to a conference in North China where they just excavated a kiln, and I saw these pieces. Now, in the background of this slide, see this here? That's actually white earthenware. You know, it's rather thickly made, rather greenish. Uh, and it came out of precisely the same stratigraphy as these two. These are pure white porcelain, as I say, as thin as silk. So the Chinese first made porcelain, first achieved porcelain, as early as AD 600. And that gave them a, a fantastic commercial advantage. They, this monopoly pro, uh, product they shipped around the world and it earned vast amounts of currency. And as we've just heard from Ava, it was also used as a diplomatic gift. It was a demonstration of what China could do and nobody else could do. I'm not suggesting that the emperor himself was personally engaged in trade, but certainly the trade in porcelain around the world very much filled his coffers. They helped keep him a rich ruler. Um, throughout the ages of Chinese history, from about AD 600. And they did ship porcelain all over the place, east to Japan and Korea, down into Southeast Asia. Then the ships um, would go through the Straits of Malacca, across to Sri Lanka, which was a great entrepot, and then on to the Persian and um, Arabian Gulfs, and this whole area of the Islamic Middle East. So trade was very active from early times in China. 
and quite how early is demonstrated by this amazing shipwreck, um, which uh, is called the Belitung shipwreck because the ship went down near a little island called Belitung Island, which is just off the western coast of Java. And you can see the amazing early date of this shipwreck. They, they date it, but one of the ceramics in the cargo actually had a date on it of 826 AD. So in the 9th century, they were, the Chinese were already shipping out vast quantities of porcelain. And when I say vast, this shipwreck contained over 57,000 pieces of Chinese ceramic. Now, the vast bulk of that were simple stoneware bowls that were going probably to local markets in Southeast Asia. But among the goods were about 200 pieces that were very high status. There was gold, there was silver, there was this amazing white stoneware painted in underglazed blue. And for those of you who are interested in this, you can see how closely this resembles Middle Eastern blue and white, particularly made in, in kilns in Iraq, for example. So this was a product made in China being shipped out, and they believe that these 200 luxury products were probably made for um, some princely customer in the Middle East. So the cargo would have been split. The 57,000 bowls would have gone one way, and the 200 luxury products another. But amazingly early and hugely exciting to those of us who follow shipwrecks. I want to talk about another exciting find. First of all, just to show you these two pieces. These are bowls that were excavated in North China. They date to the 10th, 11th century. And one of them bears this mark on the bottom which says Guan, which means official. So it's denoting that these are quite high status. I just want to show you these to prepare you for this, uh, this recent excavation, which excited us all hugely because you could say that this is the first Chinese porcelain found in Europe. Actually, it wasn't made for Europeans. It was made, of course, for the Islamic kingdoms who had, had uh, sovereignty in southern Spain. These pieces were uh, excavated um, in Almeria um, in, in southern Spain, and we can date it almost precisely because of the date at which the Islamic um, city was sacked by a Christian offensive. But this was really, you know, when they found these pieces of Chinese porcelain dating to the 10th or the early 11th century in southern Spain, it was really a big find. And you can see those bowls with petal shapes outside. This was the kind of porcelain that was finding its way to the Islamic world, probably to um, Iraq, to Iran, to um, North Africa, to Fustat, to Egypt, and some of it en ends up in southern Spain. And you can see also that it's ornamented in gold and uh, actually with um, gold writing on it. So the customers highly valued these products. And of course, um, we, we know well that blue and white was esteemed in the Middle East. Ava has just been telling us about the banquet, um, the banquets in the top carpi. And this is another piece from the top carpi, a piece of Ming blue and white, uh, which was later mounted up there. And eventually, um, porcelain, Chinese porcelain, gets to Europe. Um, Ava's told you about some of the diplomatic gifts. These are occasion, these are singular pieces. A pair of these cups were actually sold by Sotheby's in 1970. And one of them ended up in the V&A. That's this piece. And they were, the, the porcelain cups themselves, the very luxurious Chinese porcelain, you can see with gold decoration on the outside. And they were acquired in Turkey by um, a German nobleman and he took them home and had them mounted up in gilt silver. And the mounts on one piece mentions this date of 1583. So porcelain got out from China to all um, corners of the world. But I want to finish by telling you about one way in which 
the Chinese suddenly felt that they were losing ground. And it's a story about um, the borrowing of technology. It's almost reverse technological transfer from the West to China and out again. And that concerns the production of what we now call Fami Rose. So we're into the late period now. This is porcelain painted over the glaze with pink enamels. And I'm telling you about this because I think it's quite an interesting idea that for many centuries, the Chinese had complete technical mastery of ceramics. They could make porcelain, they could decorate it in underglaze blue, they employed a variety of colorful enamels, but the pink enamel came as a bombshell. So, the technology was already old in the Western world. Um, it has a long history beyond China, first in Roman and Near Eastern glass, then in Renaissance metal enameling, and then in European ceramics. And production of this fine gold ruby color was facilitated in Europe by the discovery of the purple of Cassius technique around about 1640. Now, in China, how did they learn about this? Well, we've learnt throughout this symposium about the bestowing of diplomatic gifts. And in the late 17th century, um, a series of envoys came from Europe, particularly from France and particularly from France, but also from Italy, bearing gifts which were enamelled, both enamelled metalwork and enamelled glass and enamelled porcelain. Now, ruling at that time was the great Emperor Kangxi, who ruled from 1662 to 1722. And he was a very innovative and imaginative man, and he was very eager to copy this foreign enamelling technique and to be able to produce it himself. He was really quite disturbed that Chinese technicians didn't know how to make it. So Jesuit missionaries, they followed the Chinese custom. When they came to China, they brought with them gifts for the emperor, and they also made gifts at the emperor's birthday. And the enamel gifts are mentioned in several letters. For example, one from Jean de Fontenay, which he wrote back to France, to Paris, which was written on the 25th of August, 1687. And Fontenay requested paintings on enamel and enamel objects to surrender as gifts uh, because they were enormously popular in China. And it's quite possible that when the famous Italian missionary Giuseppe Castiglioni came to China in 1715, that he also brought enameled porcelains. And I mention Castiglioni particularly because he was an amazingly um, clever man, an Italian Jesuit, who served three emperors at the imperial court between 1715 and 1766, when he actually died in China. So Emperor Kangxi actually set up an initiative to master this new technique. He appointed a German, Kilian Stumpf, to found a new glassworks just to the west of the imperial city. And one of the things he wanted was glass smelt, including this pink color. And he ordered his um, great network of, of regional governments to keep an eye on missionaries. Now, there were two reasons for this. One was missionaries were allowed to travel within China in the late 17th and early 18th century. But one, the emperor didn't want them converting people to Christianity. They were very against that. And the other thing was to keep an eye on these people and see if they were technologically competent. And if so, send them up to Beijing double quick and they can teach us some of their new techniques. And we know this from um, the writings of, of, of several missionaries. For example, the, another Italian uh, Jesuit called Matteo Ripa, who wrote in 1716, his majesty having become fascinated by our European enamels and by the new method of enamel painting, tried by every possible means to introduce the latter into his imperial workshops, which he had set up for this purpose within the palace with the result that the colors used there to paint porcelain and with several large pieces of enamel which he has had brought from Europe, it became possible to do something. 
In order also to have European painters, he ordered Castiglione and I to paint in enamels. Yet each of us, considering the intolerable slavery that we would have to suffer by having to stay away from morning to evening in a workshop filled with such a crowd of corrupt people within the palace, we excused ourselves by saying that we had never learnt that art. In spite of this, forced by imperial command, we obeyed and went on the 31st of last month to work in the imperial enamelling workshop. As neither of us had learned this art and making up our minds that we would never want to know it, we painted so badly that the emperor, on seeing what we had done, said, enough. <laughs> Thus we found ourselves free from the conditions of a galley slave. So the... Um, the Jesuit missionaries rather dug their heels in some of them and refused to cooperate. But the Chinese came up with another solution. In uh, 1716, the provincial governor of Guangdong province sent two enamel craftsmen called Pan Chun and Yang Shizang to Beijing with supplies of peach red enamel derived from gold, which had been formulated by one of these workmen, Mr. Pan. Now, Guangdong province is in the south, it's where Canton is, and this was, of course, the port which had great connection with the west. It's where all the foreign ships came in. So it's entirely possible that Mr. Pan had learnt his mastery of making pink enamel actually from a foreigner coming in via the south, not at all from missionaries and other diplomats coming in through the north, through Beijing. And some people say that this was achieved in the south, in, in Canton, as early as 1683. Now, this enamelling research, um, Kangxi enabled a big program of research, was carried out under the auspices of the Imperial Household Department, and it was located in this hall, the Hall of Mo Mo Moral Cultivation in the Forbidden City. And after 1718, larger premises were needed, demonstrating that the craft was growing in importance. Now, early, um, early pieces do show, I've examined some of these in the Imperial Collection, and they do show some um, technical deficiencies, such as burst bubbles in the enamel, you know, because the piece was fired a little high. Um, but you can see from pieces like this, this beautiful bowl, made about 1720, enameled in the new pink, that really the Chinese got onto it pretty quickly. And the, there was another French Jesuit who, who uh, visited the, the workshops in 1719, and um, he discovered, as he wrote, that the Chinese already have a certain competence in enameling, which I think was a bit kind of, you know, a bit... Um, putting them down. Now, once the palace workshops had actually worked out how to make this pink enamel, the Emperor Kangxi lost no time in showing off their competence. And he liked to show off this new achievement. And this is demonstrated by two embassies that came in 1721 from Europe. The first from Pope Clement X on January the 2nd, 1721. And his legate was shown many pieces of enameled porcelain from the imperial tab table service, whereupon the emperor graciously presented gifts of Chinese enameled ware, including a snuff bottle, a box, and ten vases. And I think the emperor must have been really pleased to say, well, you know, we can do this, we've got lots of this, you can have a few pieces. The second embassy came from Peter the Great on the 10th of February, 1721, and he was sent home with a set of enameled gold cups and enameled snuff bottles and boxes, which had been made in the imperial workshop. And it's interesting that in the collections of the State Hermitage Museum, there are still a number of early 18th century, beginning of 18th century, Chinese enameled pieces. No doubt, part of this gift to Peter the Great. So, I've led you on a bit of gallop around uh, Chinese history, but I hope that I've shown you three ways in which porcelain could be used, um, or ceramics. Firstly, um, by the emperor acting in his role as the son of heaven, 
and employing the sacrificial vessels made of porcelain to do the state rituals. Secondly, as imperial crockery for banquets and for other power events, both within his own family and also for visiting foreign dignitaries. And thirdly, as a material demonstration of China's competency, technology, their superior technology, um, and just finishing off with a little glimpse of what happened when one emperor suddenly realized that China didn't have all the answers and scrambled very quickly to augment and improve their technology. Thank you.